The seek track has landed, but the big question is, how far can you take just this box on its own? Stick around and find out. Hello universe, Chris Klein here with Allen Music Center in San Antonio, Texas. And today we're gonna to take a look at the seek track and kind of explore what this box can do on its own without any other devices connected to it, not looking at the video, just, you know, how far can we take this as a music production tool? Before we do that, I wanna ask that you please subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so. And we also have a lot of other channels that are gonna bring you more content on guitars and pianos, so please explore those as well, just in case you think you might need a guitar or piano. We've got a lot of information out there for you. So, let's go ahead, let's just dive right into this, and let's listen to it see how easy it is to function, uh, and uh, just get a, a good overall feeling for this box on its own. So here we are with Yamaha Seek Track, and you know, there's been a lot of grumbling online saying that, oh, this is gonna be a, a teenage engineering, you know, OP1 killer, and this and that, and, and this is not that device, you know. Um, it's very, very functional. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it. It feels more like a, a, a sketchbook to me, honestly, than a pro device. Um, but let's go ahead and just let's dive into it and let's not get too philosophical or hear about too many of my opinions. Let's, let's talk about the functionality and we're only going to focus on what we can actually do with the device itself. We're not gonna talk about video. We're not gonna talk about its extended functionality using iOS or a desktop. We wanna talk about, you know, if this is in my backpack, what can I get out of it when I pull it out of my backpack and what types of creations can I make and, and just how functional is it from that standpoint. So here we go. There are a couple different flavors or, or colors of this device. There's one that's all black. We have this one that's gray and orange. Uh, I kind of like this palette a little bit better myself, honestly, because it creates some separation between uh, the different functions or modules that exist. And let's talk about that. We have the drum module, the synth module, and they call this a sound design module. I, I kind of look at this more as the master section. And that's probably just for me being a, a recording engineer and you know having a lot of my global parameters or ef uh, effects returns and things of that nature being in the master section. So I refer to this as the master section. We have all kinds of buttons on the sides and up, up top. Uh, so you know if we look over here, we have our player on button. We have a page button, solo, mute, delete, uh, volume up or down. Up top, we have bar length, octave, scale, key, record sample. So this does have a built-in microphone as well as a built-in speaker. We're not gonna really explore that too much today. I will record a sample at some point. We have USB, which is the USB-C, phones, audio in, so you can bring external audio into here. Uh, MIDI, so if we look here, we have uh, an eighth inch to a MIDI in and out uh, converter as well as our tempo, BPM, BPM, swing, and projects. So, you know, if I pull this up, you can see that all these buttons are actually pretty small that exist. And we haven't talked about these yet. These are for your sound design for clearing things out. Uh, so again, the buttons are, are kind of small. Um, another thing real quick that I noticed as soon as I pulled it out of the box was, it, it's, you know, it's very lightweight, which is great, but you know, the plastic doesn't feel like it's super, super durable. And I can see, you know, this plastic starting to crack. Uh, you know, probably maybe in about, uh, let's say five to seven years. And now that's, that of course is if it's not being taken care of and handled properly and, and being stored in climbs that are appropriate for the device, its casing, and of course the electronics inside of it. So before we jump into looking at the different sections and playing with the device, let's go ahead and listen to something that I did at home. I've got about three or four hours on the device so far, and uh, this is a little electro thing. I'm going to go ahead and press play. You guys can call it whatever you want. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to go ahead and select the clap by pressing on the clap track. Here's the level for the send to the delay. There's a delay. You can also use the repeater. So 
So let's go ahead and look at this and talk about how we can build something like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a new project. Now to create a new project, I'm going to hold the project button over here. And I'm going to go ahead and select number five. So we have one through eight, nine through 16. So number five, and we only have eight projects that we can store here at any given time. So now if I press play, all we're going to hear is a kick on one. And we have 16 steps. Let's go ahead and turn that off. More about the parameters of a project. Now a project uh, can have 11 tracks. 11 tracks, and I'll show you the 11 tracks. Kick, snare, clap, and then we also have our hit one, hit two, percussion one, percussion two, synth one, synth two, the DX7 or the DX FM engine, and the sampler. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 tracks. 11 tracks. Each track can store up to six patterns. You've ac accessed the patterns by turning these knobs, and we'll show you that uh, here. I will show you that here in a sec as well. Uh, everything that's stored within uh, the project are going to be all your different sequences, uh, motion sequences, uh, the parameters of your sounds, basically anything that you have within the project that you've been working on, anything that you've manipulated, it's going to store all that information for you. So once again, eight projects. So let's look at the drum section. We have our seven knobs. And as you can tell and see, whenever I press down one of these knobs, it will audition that drum part. Everybody got that? Very, very cool. Now, if I select the kick, and I know that it's selected because I have this flashing LED, I can start going through the sounds. Now, here's where it gets tedious. All we have right now are our ears. Which is a good thing. We don't really need to know what, like, what is this called? Fat stab and, you know, whatever they're going to call them. Roomy punch. Who cares? Like, let's just listen to what it sounds like. Let's go to our snare. And that is definitely an 808 style snare. Clap. So hit one, hit two. Now you can assign any drum you want to any of these, honestly. Let's go with that hi-hat. So now we've selected some drum sounds. <clears throat> How much deeper can we go with this? Well, let's do that. Now, if I click on this button down here, this is the sound design button, it's going to allow me to change the parameters for what I'm actually manipulating, right? So if you look here right now, the four parameters we can manipulate are sound, pitch, pan, and volume. If I click on this again, Attack, Decay, Filter, and Resonance. Four and four. So let's go back up to the first selection. 
and let's manipulate pitch. So pitch is our second selection. We're going to use this knob. manipulate the pitch. If I use knob number three, we're going to manipulate our pan. Real quick, and this is just some recording engineering uh, advice, you probably want to keep your kick centered, especially in this day and age of vinyl. If you have too much low end in the left channel or right channel, especially below uh, about 120, 100 cycles, uh, and below, you can, um, you're going to cause issues for the cutting engineer, and there's a good chance that they're going to make that correction for you without even asking. Uh, if you have too much low end in either channel, it can create uh, a, 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 an anomaly in the groove, which will, which will cause, excuse me, mistracking, which can cre uh, create an issue where the needle jumps out of the groove. So that's just a, some recording engineering mastering advice for you there. Center your low end. Uh, really. Safe bet is about 120 cycles, so uh, enough of that. So we have our kick. I'm going to bring the pitch down just a little bit. Okay, and then our snare. I'm going to go ahead and pan the snare a little bit to the right. I'm going to go ahead and bring the pitch down. There we go. This hi-hat, let me go ahead and pan this off to the left just a little bit, not a whole lot. Oh, I was manipulating the pitch, my bad, sorry about that. Let's go ahead and pan. And we'll leave everything else the way that it is. Now, if we want to uh, audition the drums using the keys, we can actually do that with these seven keys right here. So I'm gonna hold down kick and then I'm going to press one of these and now go ahead and undo that which might be handy if you're doing real-time recording as opposed to step recording we're going to do all step recording today uh, by the way uh, or at least for the drums excuse me so now we have our drums dialed in <clears throat> now let's go and talk about the synth synth engines as well as the DX7 and uh, the sampler. So the synth, we can audition. One, 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 one. The same way, right? Not too terribly difficult to wrap your head around that. Since we only have seven keys, that might seem a little bit limiting. Now we can actually use the eight keys over here as a keyboard as well. Or you can have an external MIDI device plugged in, which that kind of defeats the purpose of having this small, wonderful little controller. But you know, if you're at home, maybe this is your only engine that you have or your device, you want to expand the functionality MIDI into it, there you go. You know, Bob's your uncle, right? But if we want to use this, right, we can press all We're over here on the left, and then the key button. And now you will see that we have a full keyboard. It's illuminated just like an octave keyboard, where these keys up here would be your black keys. Right, and now you can play chords. Actually, it's set to monophonic, this patch, and we'll get to that in a second. But anyhow, this is a way to get around that. You can actually have a keyboard here, but you're limited to only one octave. And the thing about that, is once you record anything on this device, let's say you record a keyboard part and you want to change uh, the key or the octave, well, you can't change those parameters once they've been recorded, at least when you're using this device uh, standalone. So let's go back to our synth. Now, how can we manipulate these sounds? Well, first off, you can see here, sound is illuminated. Portamento assigned to that. Mm -hmm. 
So there we have our synth one, there's synth two, and you can actually also browse by the different sets of patches or sound banks. So instead of just perusing the sounds like this, we can actually do it by bank. Now, there's not, as you can tell, there's not a whole lot of visual information or feedback, you know, coming at you. So if I hold down the sound knob, well, now I've got banks, right? So I can go ahead and press that. And so now we're dealing with keys of some kind of electric piano, right? Hold down again. Now we have a trumpet. What I can only imagine there's going to be more horns as we start to. Right. Hold down sound once again. Let's go ahead and press this. Back to keys. More sense. So you can quickly switch banks of sounds by doing that. And if you're going to be using this primarily as a standalone device, it's going to be up to you to remember which of these keys uh, corresponds to the banks of sounds that you're trying to access. So maybe, you know, once again, like, let's do this. And it sounds like we're going to have, like, bassy synth-type patches. Oops, wrong one. Yeah. It's like a generic 303 type of sound. Now we can also change the scale. And you can see as I press the scale button, it's going to cycle through the different scales. Now, how these scales are laid out, I don't remember. The top is minor, that's major, then we start getting into like, I think it's minor pentatonic, major pentatonic, and then uh, various other scales, whatever they happen to be. And I, I can't remember all of them right now. And again, there's not a whole lot of visual feedback. It's going to be up to you to remember all these different parameters. Or if you want to plug it into your iPhone or any kind of other device, you're going to have a lot of access to things that I wouldn't say that they're buried, but you're going to have more visual feedback and it's going to be easier for you to cycle through things. Again, for me, it kind of takes away from this being a standalone device. If I had to plug other things in to expand the functionality or to have more feedback or to access things uh, ex more expeditiously, that takes away from the value of just having a standalone device where the OP1, it truly will do everything and give you all the feedback that you need. And plus you have a keyboard and it's built a little bit better. It's also, you know, four times as much as this. This is still very powerful. I don't want to put it down. It is a fantastic device. But anyhow, let's go ahead and continue. Let's move on with the, the demo. And I don't want to get too philosophical. So here we have a bass sound. So let's find uh, a, more of a synthy sound for uh, this. Now with our synth patches or our synth tracks, as you can see here, we've got sound monopoly. So you can change it from monophonic or to polyphonic, pan and volume, right? We go to the other parameters, looking at attack, decay, filter, and resonance. So let's go ahead and play the filter a little bit. Up. So it's a pretty decent filter. Sounds like it's a four pole. So let's 
let's do this. Let's go ahead and change this to So now we have a chord. Okay. Let's go to our DX7 patch. Now, for me, honestly, this is where this really starts to shine if you're using an external device with it to access more parameters. This is a fully functioning FM synth, and you can access most of those parameters here. You're just not gonna have, once again, the visual feedback. You know, when you start manipulating the way the operators are working, it's probably a good idea to have that visual feedback. Maybe you get to a certain point and you create a sound that you really, really like and then you save it as a favorite. Okay, let's go with that. Move it up here. Change the octave. There are all kinds of samples bundled with this, and then of course you can also load in your own samples as well. Now that's one other thing that I've noticed. Sometimes these keys don't want to trigger properly. It's almost like you have to go directly right on top of it One. to get it to work. So that's probably just a, you know, a, a matter of becoming more comfortable with your muscle memory with this machine and making sure that you're pressing the keys properly. Um, I think that maybe there's maybe a design thing happening there because I would like for it to be a little more accurate at times and uh, once again you know it's going to be up to the user and you know just getting that muscle memory and making sure that you're pressing the keys correctly. All right so there we go and you know we've looked at uh, all the different drum tracks uh, remember let's refer to like each of these knobs as a track uh, the two synthesizers, which there, uh, there's no shortage of sounds on here, the DX7 or the DX, as well as the sampler. So then how do we actually program something into here? Well, it's not too terribly difficult. I'm gonna go ahead and press play. And we already have a couple of kick kicks uh, placed on here. And by default, it's gonna start off with kick on uh, the kick on one. So we'll just do a four on the floor. I'm gonna bring the tempo way back. Okay, so now we have our kick. Now if we want to have another pattern, turn the knob. Once again, we have kick on one. Now remember, I said we could have six patterns per track, and to make that happen, I'll hold down the kick, and then these three blue lights are showing me that I can actually open up those other patterns. 
And now when I select the different patterns, it will go from blue, so six, five, four, back to our green and yellow. So three, two, one. So one, two, three. And we don't have anything on uh, four through six. Just that single kick. So now let's add our hi-hat. Now you might be wondering about the length of each pattern and can we actually change that? And you can. So how do we do that? So if I hold down page and turn the track knob, I can change the length of the pattern. So as you can see right now we have 16. I can change it to 15. I can go ahead and give us a couple more. So now we have 18 steps as opposed to 16. You know, I tend to think of drum beats in steps of eight or 16. It depends on the time, the, the um, time signature that's in my head, four, four, eight, eight, seven, eight, seven, 16, five, four, whatever, right? But this is actually a cool way to get random as, random as, random Ization, excuse me, into your patterns. And you're like, well, what do you mean? How could you, like how? Well, let's do this for instance. So let's go ahead and look at our kick. So we know that we have 16 steps, but let's add one more step to it. And what happens to the feel of the drum pattern? So again, quick way to add randomization to your pattern. Just add an extra step on the kick drum. And so now you have this kick part that's gonna come back around every 17 measures, basically. But let's go ahead and undo that. So and hold down page and make sure that we're 16. Cool. Now, let's go to our synth track, and we're gonna we're gonna record this in real time. So this button right here, as you can see, it just has this single little dot. This is our record button, and I know I'm gonna record my synth because I already have it selected. Let's make sure we're on the proper tracks to track one. And I'm going to go ahead and change this Let's add a bass part Bass synth Chord I'm going to go ahead and delete that real fast because it double triggered. There we go. Let's go over here to our sound 
designer. <laughs> Let's just go with that. Let's go with the most of it. So now we have a very simple sequence, and it doesn't take a lot of time to get to that point. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are already looking at this and going, well, you're so limited by what you have here as far as the keys. And again, that's why I said I'm kind of looking at this as more of a sketchbook than a performance device. I think it becomes more of a performance device when you start using the video capabilities that exist, and we're not going to get into that. We just want to talk about, again, just making music with this right here and nothing else attached to it. And that's what we're focusing on. And you can take it really, really far. Okay. So now that we have all this information in here, can we turn this into a mixer somehow? And the answer is absolutely. The way we do that is we hold the all button and we press the volume up button over here. So all and volume up. And as you can see, now we can control the volume of all of our tracks. Let's go ahead and play it. Turn the kick back up. Let's bring our whistle down. Now you can see here we've got volume. Out of the mixer mode. There we go. Let's go ahead. Do this.
So manipulating the all button or the all knob or all track is going to change all tracks at one point, one time. Go ahead and select our clap. Let's change our effect to delay. probably wondering about other functionality of the sequencer, like latching, for instance. And yes, we can do that. How do we do that? Well, we hold down a note, and then we can actually engage it. And I know that it's on because it's now this magenta color. Now it just sounds a little sloppy, so to undo it, we just hold it down and set it back to just a single hit. So, lots can be achieved with just this device on its own. And as I've stated before, if you want to do more, if you want to open it up, and access other parameters, it's gonna be in your best interest to have it hooked up to some sort of portable device or a laptop or whatever it is that you're using. If you want to have greater flexibility in how you can play the device, as far as you know, maybe you're a keyboardist, well then you're gonna to wanna to, you know, go into your MIDI ins and outs and um, you know, operate it like that. So it's some sort of MIDI controller that has a five pin den, bring it in here. Or if you are on a computer and you have a whole setup and you're you know, using MIDI over USB, you can assign everything accordingly. Um, beyond that, the only other thing that we really haven't talked about here as far as its functionality would be soloing and muting as well as uh, swinging the device. So let's go ahead and swing. Actually, see what's happening with the swing by looking at these dots right here on this multimeter. It's probably the best way to define this a multimeter because it's going to give you feedback for certain types of functionality that are happening. Solo. It's that simple. And mute is the same way. So mute, and let's go ahead and
So we actually got through quite a bit just using the Seek Track as a standalone device. I think it's really important that we focus on that. There are a lot of videos out there already that are trying to explore every single aspect, and it's just so much to digest. I think the most important feature of this, or function, or aspect, to use that word again, is how far can we take this on its own? And we did a lot today with this. You still go a little deeper, you start getting into a little more fine tuning, um, and you're doing, uh, you know, multiple button pushes, knob pushes to get to some of the other functionality. But as you can see and hear, it sounds great. We can create something pretty, pretty fast. But, you know, as I stated, there are limitations with the keyboard uh, or lack of keyboard. And um, that to me just is, that's a, that's a big pain point. I don't want to have to MIDI in another controller to get more functionality or more playability out of the synth engines or the sampler or the DX. Uh, cool device, great for sketches. That, and I'm sticking with that. that that's, that's my two. This is a sketchbook. I know that there are going to be a lot of people out there that are really going to push this to its limits and squeeze every little penny out of the $399 that this thing costs. And as I'd stated before, you know, if you want to have more functionality, uh, more access to menus, and a better keyboard, then you probably want to go with the EOP-1. But at $399, this is pretty hard to beat. It really is. I think they created a real uh, fantastic device here. Um, it's just, for me, it, it, I'm going to say it again, it's a sketchbook. So, um, you know, go, come by and see us. Play with one, see how it feels to you. You know, you stick it in your backpack. You've got about five hours of battery charge whenever you charge it up via a USB-C. Um, we didn't talk about that in the demo, and I think it's important to know that. You know, it has a long battery life as well um, when you're playing it. So, thank you for sticking around. Really appreciate it. Please look at our other channels. If you're going to comment, uh, let's be kind to each other. The world is just in such a weird, crazy place right now. We need more kindness. We need more cohesiveness in all of our communities, especially our creative communities, our music communities. Let's lift each other up. Start sharing some of your content with us below. We've been asking for that for a while, and I still don't think we've seen that yet. If we have, bring it to, or if you have shared your content, bring it to our attention. Uh, until next time, Chris Klein, Alma Music Center in San Antonio, Texas. Thank you for sticking around. Bye.